my name's Tom Honeyman. I have the, uh, I've had a few job titles in my life, um, and I'd have to say Solutions Architect is probably the wackiest one that I've had yet. I'm the Solutions Architect for the Humanities, Arts, Social Sciences, and Indigenous Research Data Commons, which is also the longest title I've ever had. Uh, and today I'm going to go a little bit deeper on uh, what the research, what a research data commons is. We've been saying that word a lot uh, yesterday and today. Uh, we've been ac turning it into an acronym or not a lot, which I try not to do. I promise. Um, although I will later on. Um, but you know, what is a research data commons? Before I go any further, though, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today and to pay respect to their uh, elders past and present. I'd really especially like to uh, pay that respect um, and acknowledgement to the Indigenous uh, people joining us today in the room. And I'd also, uh, given this presentation, like to acknowledge uh, Dylan Sara the artist responsible for the indigenous iconography used in this presentation as well. Okay, so uh, what is a research data commons? Uh, so I have some pro forma uh, standard line that I'm supposed to say uh, in, uh, that my organisation gives me, uh, which is that a research data commons brings together people, skills, data and related resources such as storage, compute, software and models to enable researchers to conduct world-class data-intensive research. So that's the company line. I'm just going to go off script from this point onwards. Um, what I like to say is that a research out of commons is an exercise in digital placemaking. Um, that what we're trying to do in forming the commons is to assemble a bunch of people, um, pro tip, welcome to the commons. Uh, you are in it right now. Uh, to define a space, uh, pro tip, you're helping to define that space right now, uh, that meets the needs of the community that it's serving. Uh, like uh, a real physical place, uh, it's a pretty uh, amorphous thing. Um, you can have places arranged such that a city has suburbs, as you can have places within a city, you can have places within places. You can have places that are overlapping with other places. And so when we talk about research data commons, I don't know if that's the correct plural. Uh, if anyone wants to tell me, I'd love to know. Uh, then it's more that people can move between spaces um, and it's about recognising yourself as being in that place. So somewhat more dryly, uh, when you're in that place and we're talking about a, a research data commons, we are talking about um, the ability to access particular services um, and I will uh, briefly touch on that um, today. And in fact, that's what you're getting exposed to over these three days today. Uh, in particular, you're going to get a stream of case studies that will take you through uh, those services um, and, uh, and the skills that are associated with those services as well. Um, yeah. So for the, the Australian Research Data Commons is both the name of the organisation that I work for, but it's also the place that we're trying to build. And if you like, like suburbs in a, in a city, we have these specific <coughs> suburbs that we're trying to uh, build out right now. We have the People Research Data Commons, the Planet Research Data Commons, and that massive mouthful, uh, the humanities, arts, social sciences and indigenous research data commons as well. Or if you can forgive me, uh, I'm going to use an acronym from this point onwards and just call it the Hassanai uh, RDC, just so we get through this. Um, I, with our people research data commons, um, we're looking at health and medical research with our planet research data commons, we're looking at earth and environmental research. And with uh, humanities, arts, social sciences and indigenous research data commons, that's a rather big uh, family uh, of um, research concerns as well as the kinds of data that we're talking about that's relevant there. Now you as a researcher, if that's uh, what you are, 
might actually see yourselves as existing in more than one of these spaces. I know, having spoken with people uh, yesterday, that there are people who are applying humanities types approaches in a health and medical space, for instance. There's no reason that you have to only locate yourself in one of these spaces. Like moving from one suburb to another, you can move between these research data commons as well. And in fact, uh, you will have noticed that um, as you have heard, particularly from um, the Indigenous Data Network and the Language Data Commons folk, um, and actually the, you might have heard the improving uh, integrated research infrastructure for social sciences folk over in the library, um, there are suburbs within suburbs, if you like, as we move through this space, because as we drill down, uh, there are more specific concerns for researchers as well. Um, so, uh, we as the ARDC, and particularly in building out the House and Indigenous uh, RDC, we actually have nominated areas. We're not trying to cover, um, build resources for every single area of the humanities, arts and social sciences and every kind of Indigenous, um, uh, well, every type of Indigenous research data community, noting that the data that impacts upon community can be very, very broad. Uh, uh, we have these nominated areas. So, uh, I'll mention it again, but you've been hearing from the Improving Indigenous Research um, Capabilities uh, Program, which is led by Distinguished Pro uh, Professor Marsha Langton at the University of Melbourne. Uh, you've also been hearing from the, uh, you might have heard LDACA a lot, uh, the Language uh, Data Commons of Australia, which is led by Professor Michael Hoare at UQ. And if you were over in the library yesterday, you would have also heard from the folk at the Integrated Research Infrastructure for Social Sciences. Now, um, another area that we've been working in is, uh, hands up, who's actually heard of Trove, the National Library's Trove? Fantastic, all right. If you didn't have your hand up there, uh, you are gonna find out by the end of the day. Uh, we had nominated work around improving Trove uh, for researchers. It's a fantastic resource if you're the one or two people that didn't put your hand up there. Um, and you're gonna find out more about it today. But the specific programs that have been focusing on um, uh, Trove include the um, ARDC Community Lab, uh, who are joining the fold today and you're gonna hear from. Um, and uh, we also had a separate project to actually improve some of the back end and, and, and documentation for Trove as well. Um, so, for the eagle-eyed amongst you, you might have noticed that I didn't touch upon the creative arts and mediated data. Um, something that we're really excited about um, over the coming uh, six months is that we have received uh, a major amount of funding, probably the biggest investment in humanities, arts and social sciences and indigenous data research infrastructure. Um, and uh, so we are in the, at the very beginning of the journey of spinning up, uh, if you like, another uh, suburb within the city um, around the creative arts and around what we call mediated data, uh, which we're going to work on that title, uh, but uh, essentially refers to uh, web and social data. So, or if you like our digital footprint on the internet and our, uh, the traces of our consumption of the internet as well, uh, through, for instance, advertising. Um, these are both really exciting new areas and in fact, um, for other areas as well, we're in the middle of an extensive co-design um, process right now where we're really trying to build out these areas based on the lived experience of researchers. If that's something that appeals to you, if you'd like to be a part of that conversation, uh, we do have um, an events page um, uh, where you can see what events we're running and you'll see in that list that we have several co-design sessions happening right now. Uh, and uh, if you don't get this down, uh, come and talk to me afterwards. But it's our website slash events. Um, and I noticed yesterday uh, in uh, some of the feedback that we were getting at the end of the day, there were questions about how you could just zero in on the, uh, on the um, resources that are available to you. And if you've not done this already, um, <laughs> do visit this researcher page um, where you can drill down to the particular RDC that you're interested in. Um, you can sign up for a newsletter. You can also sign up to receive a series of uh, emails that will uh, guide you through. It, it does take a bit of unpacking uh, to get through all our resources. Um, 
but uh, that will guide you through the particular stream uh, that you might be interested in. Uh, and I did also uh, mention uh, that we have a newsletter. So if you're not, uh, you might have ticked a box when you registered for this event that signed you up for the newsletter, but if you are not uh, signed up for the newsletter, let me reassure you it comes twice a month. It doesn't come every day. Uh, and uh, that newsletter is a great way to find out about additional activities or developments um, and opportunities for you as, um, as members of, the, of this uh, commons that we're trying to form. I'm a philologist and work on Buddhist inscriptions. You can Google me if you're any interest in, in my research background, but my alter ego today is, however, as systemic. Um, we develop and, su and support a range of open source digital humanities platforms and specialise in immersive and engaging research experiences. Um, we've been delighted to work with ARDC over the last year or so on a range of fascinating um, and we think really productive projects. Um, we've worked with them on GHAP, the Gazetteer, on image annotation workbench, which I'll walk through today, and um, Stylometric Intelligent Archive, amongst other things. Um, so what I'll walk through today, um, or in the next 20 minutes or so, is a digital framework for scholarly annotation of images that we call image annotation workbench. So whilst I'm going to be talking about the digital, this is not a technical presentation. Um, rather, it'll be conceptual and we'll focus on strategy, models, frameworks and research outcomes. So I'll describe some of the workflows during the session, but we have our workshop tomorrow. Um, so we can, we can um, we'll, we'll, there'll be more detail then. The design brief, however, was that we build a platform to meet contemporary expectations for a delightful user experience. Our hope is that with a little familiarisation, any researcher, um, irrespective of their technical skill, can be productive, productive with, with minimal support. So, always good to frame any initiative in terms of its value proposition. The, the why question, why are we doing this? Well, we see three facets. We built IAW for its research affordances, for its application in the curation of images in the GLAM sector, and for its pedagogical potential. Now, there's faint hope of covering even one of those in any detail in 20 minutes. So I'll limit my remarks today to a brief outline of the platform and, and its research affordances and a case study of a pilot research project. So I won't even try and cover the curation or the pedagogical aspects. So on screen is an abstract of a business case we put together for the platform. I promise this is one of only two blobs of text that I'll subject you to. Yes? Um, sorry for the word affordances. Research opportunities. What, what, what opportunities do they open up to a researcher to produce peer-reviewed peer -reviewed research or non-traditional non research outputs. Yep. Um, so, in terms of this business, this abstract of this business case, I, I'll, I'll summarise it. The problem we set about, set about addressing was the institutional access issues and technical constraints which were an obstacle to scholarly analysis of images. So, institutional access and technical constraints. The opportunity we saw was the maturity and growing ubiquity of a thing called IIIF, the International um, in Image Interoperability Framework. I always stumble over it so I don't have to say it again. IIIF, yeah? So the growing ubiquity, ubiquity of IIIF in the GLAM sector and its support for seamless collaboration in the analysis of images across institutions. So that's the opportunity we saw. And so whilst IIIF is open source, it requires an investment in system development in order to be implemented in an institution or in a project. So 
The value proposition for, for IAW is that it's a generic framework that can support researchers, and this is a bit of a mouthful, that can support researchers to immediately apply semantic tags from research-specific taxonomies on images stored across multiple institutional repositories and publish those annotations as research outputs. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but that's what I hope to unpack in the next, next five or ten minutes. I will speak brief, briefly in a moment a bit more about IIIF, um, but for the moment the takeaway is that it's a, st it's a standard protocol. So we originally built a prototype platform in 2022 to support some ARC and North American funded projects. Um, with generous funding in 2023 from ARDC, we've been able to develop the platform as part of the CDL program. I think it's important to point out that ARDC contribution wasn't just financial. Firstly, it took vision on the part of people like Jenny Fuster to cast forward and see this as a worthwhile initiative. Also, the input of the CDL team, and they're here today, people like P.D. Sefton, Tom and, and Owen O'Neill, their input with regard to the digital architecture and the long-term sustainability of the, of, have been really most valuable and made it a much better platform for it. So, in 2023, we ran a pilot project with the University of Sydney um, on the ARC-funded Opening Australia's Multilingual Archive Project, in which we used image annotation to explore cultural history. We also ran a pilot project with the Power Institute at UCID to trial the pedagogical potential of image annotation with art history students. And then through 2022 and 2023, we ran pilot projects with two international collaborations using image annotation as an art historical and epigraph epigraphic practice. And epigraphy is the analysis of inscriptions. I'll work through one of these, the Gandharan Buddhas, as a case study. And hopefully we'll draw out some of the possibilities of image annotation as a research practice. So the Gandharan Buddhas project was a partnership with the Met in New York, the National Gallery of Australia, New South Wales Art Gallery, Power Institute and the Peshawar Museum in Pakistan. And the objective was to trial the platform on a selection of Gandharan statues, reliquaries and, and friezes. And the outcomes were featured in, in an Australian art journal um, last year. So the project is now being expanded as Image Gandhara with collaborating institutions in Australia, Pakistan, Europe and North America, pulling together related initiatives around the digital imaging of artefacts, the development of vocabularies and image annotation as a scholarly and curatorial practice. So, I've noted down the core practices we engaged in the project, and you'll get, get a glance at some of these shortly. Firstly, what we do is provide tools to outline components of images, and then label and identify those components in, in multiple languages. You could add scholarly notes, much like footnotes. You could develop vocabularies and then undertake semantic tagging of those components with those vocabularies. You can do grouping and semantic linking of components. And then we then undertook the analysis of the annotations data and the publication of non-traditional research outputs for peer review. I know everybody says this, but, but we did find the collaboration to be really productive. It brought together specialist researchers, the curatorial expertise of the galleries with digital methods and design. And we found the GLAM institutions were both accommodating and really genuinely keen to collaborate with specialist expertise in expanding both the scholarship about their collections and the accessibility of that knowledge. So our pilot objectives, and this is, and I will demo some stuff in a moment, but. So one objective was to open out new avenues for cross-disciplinary research and for engagement between art historians and, and textual specialists. 
So we consulted widely with Gandhar and art historians, and the initiative, as I said, has taken on so, quite some momentum. The second objective was to make these cultural assets more accessible to a range of cohorts, not just specialist scholars. We wanted to address general scholars, students and, gen and the general public. A third objective, which is a whole topic in itself and probably best for, left for another day, is the notion of digital repatriation of these artefacts. It's worth pointing out that one of the items we worked on for the NGA has actually been physically repatriated, returned to Pakistan. And NGA now has, retains only the digital trace that we developed for them. It's also worth pointing out that an important aspect of the next phase is to open up the annotation practice to other voices in Pakistan outside of scholarly cohorts. So image annotation workbench supports any number of annotation sets. So you can have different researchers complementing each other or contesting with each other on the same image. And IIIF supports the flexible disclosure of those annotations. Different cohorts, different groups, depending on who they are, can see different, different sets of annotations. Left-hand corner, you can see a, uh, a Buddha image. And you can see that if I, on, on each component of that image, there are, it's the ability to click on any part of that image. And what pops up are individual annotations. So you can see a, um, each one has individual tags, so from, from domain-specific taxonomies. In this case, it's a Gandharan um, art taxonomy. And so I've clicked on, you can see that clicked on there is the tags, you can't see it really, Bodhisattva in standing position. And if I clicked on the notes tab in there, you would see a list of notes through there. Um, and they would be uh, the correlative footnotes, yeah? So you've got um, five or six editors over the years have worked on this particular, um, uh, uh, this particular piece and have comments to say about that particular component. Um, You can, there is a containment hierarchy of the, image, of the, of the um, outlines in that um, if I clicked on smaller portions of that image, you would pop up individual annotations for hand and for the hair and for the robe and for the, the crown, etc. Um, okay. Um, Um, I'm, I'm just really going to, well, one way of dealing this might be if I can somehow take the screen over here. I um, wonder if anybody can uh, has any idea about how we Oh, maybe it's under here. How we get to um, out of this out of this mode, and I can display the whole screen rather than just the the um, yes. Do you want to get out of this mode? Yes, I do. Okay, we'll just have to live with it. I I, I do apologise. I do apologise. Okay. What I was going to show you, but can't show you, and, and I'll just have to describe it, and we'll, um, we'll back this up with a workshop tomorrow. OK. So what we can do is, what we can do is, is we can, we provide tools to allow you to annotate each part of the image. We can generate a table of annotations automatically from that image with the cutout of the, the annotation and the, the taxonomy terms and any notes that have been applied to it. So you get a, a generated out of there a, t a table of those annotations. Um, you can see there in the, in the other screen on, on the, the, the bottom right that we've also tackled it so that you can click on a particular word in, a, in, a, in an inscription and it highlights those annotations on the image and indeed it, and it, it highlights on a, on a three, 3D model as well. Yeah? So you've got this annotation between text, image, and 3D model, yeah? Um, 
And each of those things can produce peer-reviewed digital publications. And from our project, we, we have been able to produce di um, digital journal articles that have uh, an overview of the, um, the significance and provenance of the piece, the issues about its significance, uh, about, about controversies in current scholarship about it, and then includes the image, and then includes that table of annotations below it. Okay, so I'll move on. Um, so the research outputs um, we produced in the pilot include the annotated image as a non-traditional research output itself. So the actual image that's been annotated is a non-traditional research output. We produce peer-reviewed journal articles, both digital and conventional. And we produced the annotations data as searchable data. So with one of our projects, we've been able to generate annotations data around petroglyphs, which are scraped on rocks, and inscriptions on a range of rocks that are under threat in the Upper Indus Valley in Pakistan. And those are now searchable on a website. You can search through and find every instance of a, of a hunting scene or every instance of a, of a, of a Buddha image on rocks on these, on, on these under, on these, um, in these sites. The other possibility is that you can, we use this, this annotations data as a training set for artificial intelligence. By actually outlining each of the components of an image and tagging it with a taxonomy, giving it a label, then you have a training set that can be used, that can be used to train AI to recognise those components in other images. So I did threaten to show you one more piece of text. And um, this is what I did was um, under pressure for a concise description of what IIIF is, I did what everybody does these days, I asked ChatGPT, yeah? <laughs> Um, and and I've I got to say, it, it gave me a summary that would have taken me half a day to write. I'll just read out a little bit of this. IIIF is a set of shared API standards for the rich and high quality delivery of images online. It is developed collaboratively by a community of the world's leading libraries, museums, universities, etc. IIIF aims to provide researchers, scholars and other users with consistent and robust access to visual materials. Yep. So the things to take away is that a core strength of IIIF is its support for interoperability. That, that it, IIIF is being adopted at galleries, libraries and museums around the world. It's not just a set of technical specifications, it's also a community. So people working around the world to build tools and, and, um, and um, sharing best practices. It's built on open standards, ensuring that it's freely available to anyone. Anyway, the takeaway from all of that is that we built IAW to conform to, to take advantage of, and contribute to IIIF. Um, and if you're at all interested, you can go to IIIF.org where there's a plethora of introductory resources about the standard and about its, its usage. So back to, trip to the platform to the, 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 that we've built. Um, it's been built with an open source stack. And the salient points are that we're running an instance of IAW on a Nectar server. Images can be hosted on that Nectar server really only as a workplace or a sandpit, but images can also be accessed from institutional servers. So IAW sits there grabbing images either from institutional servers or from our sandpit. Research outputs can be configured for institutional or publication specific standards. So you can theme them to, to look like NGA outcomes or, the, or they can be themed for your particular project. So this platform is really an exemplar of a digital service pattern that emphasises modularity, reusability and multiple access methods. And so the three components of the solution are, as I mentioned, the image server that you can use as a sandpit, the IAW server that is a full API, for application programmatic interface, and the IAW application, which is the user interface that researchers use. I, I probably should emphasise again, researchers can interact with the platform either through a user interface, click and drag and do these things, or through an, an application programmatic interface, through an API. Um, 
Foundational to the CDL digital architecture is a comprehensive sustainability strategy. So the key components for that again are for us that it's an open source stack, that it's compliant with all of the IIIF and web annotation standards, and that you can export from IAW all of the data that you invest in it in, in a IIIF manifest. So you're not stuck on our platform, you can do work on our platform, export it as IIIF, use it with other IIIF tools. That's really critical to sustainability. Um, other things that also parts of that sustainability strategy are a persistent ID solution, so that if servers move, your links will all still work, and an image archive strategy that looks at long term look, looks for long term sustainability and reproducibility of the research outputs ultimately getting those images onto th things like the Internet Archive so that they'll always be there. And of course, we're happy to unpack those strategies in our workshop tomorrow. So what I'll do now is just a very brief walkthrough of some of the foundational workflows. I'm not going to do all sorts of clicky, clicky, clicky stuff. I'm just going to show you some screens and that'll give you the, the general idea. Um, but what you can see on screen is actually image annotation workbench and what I have selected is the image Gandhara collection and you can see that there are one, two, three, four, four image sets there and I could then click on one of those image sets and go in and start annotating it. Um, so the foundational workflows for this, sort of, for this workbench are creating new research collections, adding images to those collections manually or by searching other image repositories, institution repositories and pulling in those images. The annotation, which is the outlining components and annotating them with tags and notes and links. And then there's sharing collections and collaborating with colleagues. So you can, you can start up a project, build your collection, share it with a colleague and they can do their own sets of annotations that you can work with them on. And then there's publishing, then you can share the annotated image with the rest of the world as a research output. Um, so, and again, I'll just, it'll only take a few seconds, you can see these are some of the screens. Creating a collection, you're just going to describe the collection. Adding an image set to the collection, there's some buttons there to add the image locally or add it from a remote, uh, remote um, image either by a, by a URL or by a IIIF manifest. Um, there's also the ability to search a repository for an image as well. Once you've created your image set, then you can create an annotation set. So there's my annotations and then there's a colleague of mine, Mark Allen's annotations on this, on this item. And then once I've created my annotation set, I can go in there and you can see the image there with all the little blue lines around it. And to do that, you simply use one of the tools to outline a, a component. What pops up is some simple UI that allows you to put in a, a tag a, a, and put in a description for the annotation pops up a taxonomy of terms that you can pick from and tag that annotation, put in descriptions, put in footnotes, etc., and links, etc. So once you've done that, once you've annotated your image, you can just share it with, with another user. So I can share that image with, with a colleague and they can do the same thing. And then I can publish it. I can generate a public URL that'll be persistent, I can send to anyone in the world and they can review this, or I can embed the annotated image in a, in a, in a web, web page. So I did mention before that, that anything you can do with a platform you can also do via API and in our workshop tomorrow we'll work through this. Um, don't even try and read that, I'll explain what it is. Um, so all of the features available from the UI are also accessible via an API. And we'll generate some sample Jupyter notebooks tomorrow that call the API and give you a chance to run them yourself. And the one here that is, is just a simple query that queries a, a collection of images and says, go and find any annotations that have the keyword robe or a, ta a tag called robe in them and bring all those back. And then it started to format those at the bottom where you can see that it's given me the annotations that are on different images that are, that are of a robe. So that's just a simple, really simple demonstration of what you can do. So to summarise um, all this, 
The value proposition as a research, as a research in infrastructure is firstly that it's standards based. The ubiquity of IIIF supports research across institutional collections. It has wide research application. Um, it spans a range of FOR codes that might, might make use of this. It's not a tools we've developed in the past were just for a tiny little area of research. The very low skill threshold. Anybody within 10 or 15 minutes can start annotating an image. Um, it supports research collaboration and con contestation. You can, we've already integrated with Research Vocabularies Australia, so you can search for and pull in the vocabularies domain-specific vocabularies for your, for your discipline. It's been integrated with the Public Records Office of Victoria to search and retrieve their images. We can use the search API for other galleries and libraries and GLAM institutions in Australia to allow you to search their, search their collections and pull images in. And it supports non-traditional research outputs and NTRO publishing. You can generate research outputs to support elite scholarship as research outputs. It also supports multiple voices and selective disclosure. So we've got multiple voices can annotate and there's selective disclosure. Multiple communities can, can you, a lot of work can be done on that side. Um, and it's just, and it's, it has sustainability break, um, baked in, in terms of its um, persistent IDs and archiving strategies. Um, cognizant of time, so I'll skip through this one quickly. Um, we did a bit of a scan of FOR codes to look at where we see obvious applications for IAW. And I've got to say, for us, having built tools for philologists where there's 20 of us worldwide who use it, this one's great. It, 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 it's, it's, it's like a shotgun. There's so many different areas of research that can use this sort of tool. Uh, it, maybe it's not their main research tool, but it's a, an augment to what they do at least. Yeah. But so rather than riffing on this now, we'll, we'll, in our workshop tomorrow, we'll canvas some of these research propositions with the participants. Um, just in terms of customising it, um, we're currently designing a plugin for manuscripts and inscriptions. So I showed you the, the, the pop-ups that let you just tag a, a part of an image. We're developing a custom plugin that's just tweaked for uh, textual scholars that does all the stuff that allows them to put in grammatical grammatical information and these sorts of things. So that's that's a plugin that we're developing. We've already had clamour already for the design of a plugin to allow one to annotate an image with multimedia objects. So you you create an annotation and then embed a sound or a video file or another image in there. So that's already coming. That clamour's already started for that for museum collection applications. Um, lastly. Um, the platform allows customiz theming customisation and customisation of the research outputs. So I mentioned before that what this looks like is what we wanted for our project, yeah? But you can theme the output for, for institutional branding or for your project specific requirements and you can also customise the annotations and build web applications that govern what people get to see. It's not easy to see, but you can, this, this here, this table of outputs, there's a toggle there, you can switch from one to the other, you can see the image view or the table view, and then you get a whole bunch of settings there about what you see. Now, that was something that we built in a couple of days last week for our, for our application, but I think when you start looking at multiple communities, in terms of governing access to what they should see and what you don't want people to see, though there's a lot of that can be done in terms of control of those things. So, um, uh, thanks very much for your indulgence. All right, so I'm Kane. I'm a software developer at the University of Newcastle, and. Uh, I work on the TLC map project and I am responsible for implementing um, uh, geo, uh, geospatial analysis um, functionality as well as um, place name recognition and geocoding uh, functionality. 
But I'm not really going to talk about that today. This is just a, it's not even really a case study, by the way. It's sort of a mini lecture. Um, I wanted to get people interested in the subject of G GIS analysis. And um, I hope you all learn something interesting. <laughs> All right, so this is the overview of topics. Um, uh, the field of GIS analysis is both broad and deep, and there's no way I can cover all of its volume in uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> but I've um, narrowed things down to uh, the several, several concepts that I think are most important for um, an introduction to the subject. So yeah, first we'll, we'll answer the question, well, what is it, GIS? Then we'll talk a bit about spatial data types. Um, then an overview of GIS analysis. Then I'll, um, we'll discuss the difference between descriptive and inferential techniques in GIS analysis. And I'll provide an example of each. Um, then we'll talk a bit about application domains. And I did have a case study video, but uh, it's possible we'll skip that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll conclude with the summary. All right, so what is GIS? Well, GIS stands for uh, Geographical Information System, and it's any uh, computer system that allows you to uh, store, process, um, or visualize or otherwise uh, otherwise perform operations on geospatial data. And uh, it is, they essentially provide uh, virtual representations of um, Earth in space and often also in time. Oh, and examples include Google Earth, ArcGIS, and of course GHAP. Um, and I've used GHAP as the example picture there. If you don't know what it is, uh, You'll be interested in it, trust me. <laughs> um, okay. So there are fundamentally two different types of spatial data. There's uh, raster data and there's vector data. Um, so raster data is spatial data that's represented uh, as pixels or grids. And um, an example is raw satellite imagery. So if you're looking at um, Google Maps uh, in satellite mode, then or Google Earth, then you're looking at a, um, a raster image. And uh, raster data is often used uh, for the analysis of continuous data. So if you want to map a temperature um, over some given uh, area on the surface of the Earth, you would, um, you know, uh, shade shade the pixels based on um, the intensity of the temperature of that area, to, to, for um, a simple example. And vector data is represented as geometric objects. So you've got points, lines, and polygons. So points represent, uh, you could use a point to represent, say, a city, um, or, um, you know, a disease, uh, the recording of a disease or anything like that that's discrete. So it, basically vector data is used for discrete entities. And you would use, say, lines to represent uh, railways or roads or, um, well, those are the two examples that come to my mind. And polygons. So polygons would uh, could be used to represent boundaries. Right, so well, what is GIS analysis then? Uh, well, GIS, GIS analysis is essentially just geospatial analysis applied to GIS data. And geospatial analysis is a subset of spatial analysis. And a lot of uh, the techniques you're using geospatial analysis um, can be applied in all sorts of um, scenarios. It's not limited to maps of the earth. So a lot of the techniques, for instance, you could apply to, you know, uh, bacteria colonies on a petri dish or something like that. 
but um, in the context of GIS analysis, we're specifically talking about the surface of the Earth or data relative to the surface of the Earth. Uh, analysis is often statistical, but not always. Um, so some techniques such as uh, we, in network analysis, such as you know, uh, the algorithms that are used to find um, optimal paths, which your GPS u uh, uses, by the way, to navigate you from A to B. Uh, so they're, they're an example of um, uh, geospatial analysis techniques that aren't strictly statistical. But yeah, the, the vast majority are statistical in some way or another. And uh, artificial intelligence can also be used for GIS analysis, which is very exciting and something I'm invested in. Uh, for instance, predicting um, where natural disasters will occur or um, predicting where a cyber attack is coming from, for instance. And the, there's many uh, domains of application and but common ones that uh, well, domains that commonly use GIS analysis is uh, criminology, epidemiology, environmental science, and so on. But there are plenty of uh, applications in humanities as well. All right, so what's the difference? But Well, there are fundamentally two different types of uh, GIS analysis. Just like with uh, st uh, traditional statistical analysis, you've got descriptive techniques and then you have inferential techniques. So descriptive techniques involve um, describing a data set rather than, or a sample from a population, rather than trying to make inferences about the, um, the population that the sample comes from or the, f the underlying phenomenon that has been examined. So examples in the context of GIS analysis is point distribution analysis, um, even just plotting points on a map and describing um, the distribution, that's an example as well. And grouping and summarizing location data, uh, for example, aggregating by state for the variable of median household income would be a very simple example. Inferential techniques, on the other hand, involve Looking at patent, looking for patterns in a data set and seeing whether we can make generalizations or inferences about the sample um, or from the sample about the population it comes from or about the underlying phenomenon. And this includes uh, hypothesis testing and uh, predictions and forecasting. So this is an example of descriptive GIS analysis, um, point distribution. So on the map here, we see uh, a distribution of points. And the red one is the geo midpoint. So that's the average point in the data set. So that's the center of mass, essentially. And we can see that it's, uh, the points are clustered on the eastern side of Australia, especially New South Wales and uh, Victoria. And uh, is Professor Hugh here? Oh, I was going to ask him if he recognises the map, uh, what the map is. Do you know which map this is? The points? No, I can't do that. Okay, it, it's, you, you know, the, the place references from I've Been Everywhere, in <laughs> the Australian version. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he indeed has not been everywhere, but he, 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 he got kicked out of the truck before he got to finish those, so we don't, we'll never really know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then, then what we can do after we visualize it and we calculate the geo midpoint is we can calculate the displacement stats. So um, there's two ways of doing that. So in this case, what I've done is calculated the distances between each pair of points and then found the mean, median, minimum, maximum. But you can also calculate the distance from each point to the geo midpoint as well to get some, um, an idea. Uh, you know, some metrics on distribution as well. So in this case, the mean is 720 kilometres, so on average, any uh, two points are 720 kilometres apart. The median is 636, so that tells us that 50% of the points um, 
are within 636 kilometres of each other. And the shortest distance between each point is two kilometres and the maximum is 3,218. And that tells us that there's a, the data set is skewed because the max is so much different from the median and mean and min. Um, and that's been caused largely due to that place way up in the Northern Territory. Just, uh, I'm sorry, a, a quick example of where this could be practical in um, your own lives is if you're going on a holiday to a city and you know all of the attractions and places you want to visit, you could uh, calculate the geo midpoint and look for a hotel around that area. <laughs> and you can also, instead of using displacement, like that's the straight line distance, you can also use dis like actual travel distance as well which makes more sense in a lot of cases. All right, so for an example of uh, inferential GIS analysis, um, the example I've chosen is Moran's eye. And uh, it's, a, it's a measure of spatial autocorrelation. And autocorrelate, spatial autocorrelation is a measure of how similar uh, geographical features are to their neighbors. And uh, so you calculate Moran's eye, and uh, the value will be between, it's on a continuum between minus one and one, where minus one uh, represents perfect dispersion, so points are nothing like their neighbors, and one represents perfect clustering, so points are very similar or um, precisely similar to their neighbors. And yeah, it's, it's used in You'll see this everywhere in GIS analysis and just spatial analysis in general. And a Moran's eye is often conducted as part of a hypothesis test. So you have a, you know, a, a test statistic and a p-value. And it's actually the spatial equivalent to, um, uh, to Pearson's R correlation for any stats nodes. And this is an example, a uh, conceptual example of the spatial correlation, autocorrelation. So the one on the right, that's plus one. Uh, that's perfect uh, positive spatial autocorrelation. The one in the middle is just no spatial autocorrelation, so it's completely random. And the one on the left is negative spatial autocorrelation. So the application domains uh, are very vast. Uh, you can apply these techniques whenever you have geospatial data, but it's very common in disaster management and response, uh, tracking and predicting natural disasters. You have uh, uses in urban planning, uh, land use analysis, for instance, plotting um, you know, the different parcels of land, uh, and also spatial optimization for service placement. Then, of course, crime analysis uh, is a big one. So, uh, hotspot analysis um, for assigning police patrols is one example. And then, transportation and logistics, uh, for, for instance, planning optimal bus routes, uh, optimizing postal deliveries. So, if you're wondering why your Amazon packages arrive so quickly, usually, uh, <laughs> then uh, it's because they, uh, they apply these sorts of techniques, um, like the one, like Dijkstra's algorithm and things like that that I mentioned earlier. But that doesn't really explain why some of your packages are damaged though. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, geospatial analysis or GIS analysis, whether, uh, whichever way you like to look at it, was very important during uh, COVID. Uh, because uh, these techniques were used to track and the spread of the disease and to identify hotspots. Um, what time have we got? All right, so I was going to play a video, but I don't want to take up Tim's time with a video. Um, OK. So it, it's, it's, OK, it, it's um, an example of, um, GIS analysis, well, GIS technology and analysis used um, for a humanitarian cause, and it shows um, the profound impacts that these tools can have when put in practice. 
I wanted to show an Australian example, but I couldn't find one. <laughs> if anyone does, please send it to me. Pre 1988, the global polio situation was desperate. We had approximately 300,000 children being paralyzed with polio each year. We've reduced polio incidence by 99%, and there's still the potential for the rest of the world to be reinfected if we don't actually finish. Nigeria has been on a, a bit of a roller coaster with polio eradication. One of the challenges that we have in, Ni in northern Nigeria is making sure that we reach almost every child in almost every single settlement, enough so that the polio virus has nowhere left to go. We create maps, a pictorial representation of what you need to cover during the course of a polio campaign. Unfortunately, that exercise has never been perfect, and as a result, we miss kids. One of the gaps in our microplanning process is that we don't have enough tools to make sure that we're capturing all of our boundary areas, especially settlements that sit between boundaries, because those are the people who are most likely to be missed. What could we learn from mapping to try to improve our standard tools, our paper products, the cartoon maps? Could we use GIS technology to improve the quality of these maps and then to use GPS tracking devices as an additional tool for monitoring what do teams do when they actually head out into the field? The beauty of GIS mapping is that it provides a more accurate representation of exactly what's out there to help inform the decision making about where vaccinators go it makes it possible to think about the distance between these communities so that you can be efficient around how you deploy your teams. It also captures those settlements that are in boundary areas that perhaps have been missed because you've really got to sit together with people and, and decide who's now going to cover each one of these settlements. GPS tracking is a very simple process. Uh, vaccinators have got to carry an Android phone. They return it at the end of their shift. That will actually tell you whether the team is moving through the village or not. Immunizing kids in front of the village chief's house is not what uh, they're expected to do. They have got to visit every household because there will be children who will not come to the village chief's house because the parents want to be convinced or they have questions. We're getting to, you know, this extra 5 to 10 percent of settlements that we're identifying now at the local area that weren't actually on the original maps. And in, in the fight to end polio, all of those communities are important. So um, that's basically it for today. Uh, well, I try to cut a little some things of this presentation, but the idea is to introduce a, one part of a big project that is called IRIS. I will intro introduce more what is IRIS and what is health social. After that, the idea is to uh, see the motivation, why we wanted to do this, uh, and what is the context of all, all this idea. Uh, I will, uh, as well, touch some concepts of uh, spatial data and data integrations, and after, uh, show a service design and a demonstrator of the idea to we want to show today. Uh, <laughs> When I'm studying my bachelor in history, I'm start to understand when the societies start to grow and the time pass, they start to become more and more complex. So we need to create as well tools that can help us to understand how to solve the problems and how to understand the change in society. In particular in Australia, we have some challenges like every day we are facing, but we don't have enough tools uh, that can enable us to uh, understand all these changes uh, in real time. So, after, as solution of this problem, a couple of years uh, uh, with some universities and RDC, uh, the, idea, uh, the project to integrate research infra infrastructure for social science, uh, IRIS, was created with the idea to address the fragmentation of the Australia's social science uh, research infrastructure and create rapid tools to improve and help uh, to solve this problem. In particular, is six uh, work package, like have different uh, approach. 
Today, we are going to focus on just one of these that is called GeoSocial. Uh, it's more information on the website, like you can uh, like read about the other work package. But yeah, we have a little uh, limited time to, to, to try to get into. So GeoSocial, in particular, try to address one problem that I think many people here have been facing before, and is you have a very good idea to research. You have, I have this hypothesis, I wanted to make uh, like how I can prove if this is true or how I can do this integration to prove the hypothesis. So we have the research question, we have some data sets, for example longitudinal data sets, and we want to as well integrate with some geospatial data and even some other data sets. But this integration sometimes requires a lot of work. Like, we need to get into uh, geospatial knowledge, we need to get into programming uh, knowledge, and try to do all this linkage could be very overwhelming. So the idea of GeoSocial is try to standardize all the protocols like we, a lot of researchers are doing at the same time, and try to simplify this process uh, uh, to avoid redundancy. So the motivation, and I will put, I'll explain more in the future, some actors like creates constraints in this uh, problem. But we have a longitudinal data. I'm going to explain what is a longitudinal data with more detail uh, soon. But we have a data set like our observating behavior, uh, the behavior of the people in Australia for a couple of years. And we want to integrate this data set with geographical data. For example, uh, one data set can have the postcodes of the people where they live or where they're being studied uh, all their life. And this geographical data contains sensitive data because anyone wants to have your data where you live. So usually these data sets are a like the data custodians store these data sets and have a strong policies to take care of your sensitive data and don't give the postcodes where you live to everyone. So the idea is when we wanted to do these integrations, we need to face with uh, some data custodians and some strong standards to uh, protect the privacy of the people that we are talking here. So when we have this uh, longitudinal data and we wanted to enrich the data, for example, we know where the people uh, live, but the context where the people live can say more than the same person uh, itself. So for example, the neighbor where you grow up have some characteristics and some uh, contextual uh, and sociodemographic characteristics that can explain more where uh, is the, the context. So the idea is to, we can observe different uh, waves or GRs of the census, and we can try to merge this data to enrich this data and understand some uh, questions like we cannot uh, solve in a traditional method. I will show some examples and motivation how we can do this, but the idea is to we want to enrich data with geospatial data uh, in this case to solve uh, problems. The current landscape is we have, we do like, we have some fragment data. We don't have a good infrastructure about the data. Everyone is doing similar things, but isolated. Uh, it's not a good documentation. So people just write her scripts and in her own. It's not at the requirements of good documentation. And the consequence of this is a lot of duplication work. A lot of research in Australia are doing the same work. And uh, this is how we are losing a lot of productivity, repeating all the time the same. Uh, and it's very time consuming. So we identify like some people, well, characters, some personas and users that like, can use this tool. Uh, we have three uh, target groups, low skill level, mid level, and advanced user level. The main difference uh, between these Three kind of users is the domain in geospatial data and as well the coding uh, skills. So when we want to do a merging data, we need to have some knowledge and be aware about some decisions that can affect all the research uh, project. So 
In this project, we focus in particular to mid-level users and advanced users, but in the future, we wanted to focus in low-skill levels. So the idea to is create a more a, a interface to a, improve and get to the low-skill level. A, we identify like the preferred language in these groups are Stata in particular, because we can uh, have a lot of uh, metadata and we can have a lot of information there, but it's a lot of people start to use in R. So we uh, did two years ago a uh, service, like which language are using more people, and we identify like R are growing in the community and it's important to try to uh, get into this language. Why R? Well, there's a couple of reasons because we identify like it's very fast and well, not as, as good as Python to machine learning, but for this study, it's easy and fast. We identify like it's very, uh, you can adapt this program to the, your necessities and environments, and in particular have a, a big community, and we love this. Like we can create uh, some libraries and the community will be supported and have uh, feedback in this. And as well, uh, the documentation, all the libraries in R have to uh, strict standards and have a very, a very good documentation. Uh, so this is good because we can avoid the problem to miss documentation. And the best thing is free and have a very good license. And this picture show how the community of R have been growing in the last couple of years in Star Overflow, so it's a very famous platform. So after this, we identify, like we want to create a solution like can allows us to enrich data with geospatial data to can communicate to mid-level users and advanced users through a code script, like R coding script, that have a clear documentation and examples and follow the standards of establish uh, the data by the data custodians. I'm going to explain what is the standards of the data custodians later, but this is an important thing because we cannot run all into the cloud. Why? Because we don't want to have privacy data of all the postcodes of Australians in a cloud that can be hacked for someone else. So this is a very important uh, thing like I mentioned later, and as well, uh, the other thing that is important is we wanted to, this is open uh, and, access, and free access and can be uh, built in by the community of Australian researchers. Uh, another requirement is fair principles. We wanted to, this is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So one of the key things is to this uh, geosocial work package is part from other six work package from Iris and we wanted to, this is interactable for the others. So for example, if the other work package improve the metadata, we can connect GeoSocial with this metadata and enrich the data better. So what is, that was the requirements to, uh, we want to create this solution. So the solution, uh, given that the constraints was, okay, we want to create a R library like contain the main functions and the main uh, code and can be performs all the data linkage in the local environment. I will show the solution later, but I wanna just to put the, introduce that we are going to build in our library that can address uh, this problem. The motivation, why we wanted to do this. So the cross-sectional data, uh, and we want to just introduce what is the difference between cross-sectional data and longitudinal data. So when we have a popular census, so a consumer expanded survey of opinion polls, we randomly choose people and we observe in one moment of the time. And we say, I can use these people for answer one question at the time. In addition, we have more complex data called longitudinal data. Uh, where we are following people uh, for different years, and with this uh, behavior, we can answer uh, different kind of questions. For example, uh, the main difference between cross-sectional and longitudinal data, and why we are focused, 
in longitudinal data in this uh, case is because we can answer questions about a, like cause and effect studies. It's not the best, I, I, in economics you see a lot of constraints like when you try to always study cause and effect, you have a lot of models to complicate uh, the, this, but the longitudinal data is good enough to start to have some behaviors about how the people uh, can change her behavior. And the, this is very good because you are observing the same person different points of time and you are controlling by the same person. So the idea too when you use longitudinal data is to you can avoid a uh, noise and you can try to answer uh, very important and powerful questions uh, reducing the noise. So the difference between cross-sectional and longitudinal are here. I just want to mention a couple of these ones. And it's cross-sectional, like we use a lot cross-sectional, like survey poll, census, is cheap because we use a small random sample of people, but have the problem to have just one point of time. Uh, the benefit of longitudinal, we're, we're observing the same people, but it's a, another issue as well, which is some people don't want to be followed for 10 or 20 years. So it's a very high level of attrition, right, attrition, because the people is like, okay, I'm into this study the first two years, three years, and the study is 10 years, and the other seven is a lot of noise. So we need to be afraid of, about that as well, and the other thing is to the longitudinal uh, service are very expensive because we need to follow the same people for the same time, question, try to let me know if you change your postcode, your address, your phone, and every, everything. Uh, in Australia, in the Australian context, we have a lot of longitudinal service. We, in particular, to this study, we use different data providers and identify what is the top five of a longitudinal service in Australia. One of these ones uh, that, well, I don't wanna focus in each one of that, but one two for us will be important is the longitudinal uh, survey of Australian youth. And I will uh, introduce a little later. Oops, sorry. <laughs> but the surveys have as well a bias. And it's important to be afraid when you are doing a research all the different type of bias. I just want to touch all the bias that's in this picture, but I wanted to be, we need to be afraid that the people when are doing a survey, they can lie us. And they have a different reasons for doing it. When I do in my income, yeah, maybe I don't want to say how much is my income because of privacy or some concerns. So we have a different kind of bias and different methodology, like we can improve this. So the idea is to, in the tool, when we do this solution, we found a lot of people like create fake postcodes. Like, what is your postcode? This one. And when you try to do the match or looking, this postcode doesn't exist. So it's important to introduce this bias into the tool because we wanted to show to the research like it's a little bias and you need to be aware of how noise can be affected in your research. So after that, another thing too was important for us was the data custodians. We have a different institution in Australians. This is the definition uh, from ABS, like what is a data custodian and what are the roles. Basically, the data custodians protect the data and the surveys. Some institutions create these surveys and they try to uh, publish. So you need to create a formal request to get access to this data. In particular, in this project, one of the most difficult parts was try to get access to uh, data. We tried to get first for one longitudinal survey and we got rejected because we tried to basically do a library with sensitive data. In a, so it's kind of difficult to try to create this engagement uh, because the data custodians, of course, try to protect the data of the and the privacy of the users. Uh, so yeah, we, in particular, when someone wanna get data, need to uh, enter in a project agreement, justify why are you going to use this data, what is the research, uh, and everything very formal. And the responsibilities of the data custodians, as is shown in this picture, 
is we have our postcode here, and the data custodian try to protect this. So how? We need to have a safe storage. We cannot storage this in my laptop in my house. We need to satisfy certain passwords, uh, certain policies to storage the computer and everything. And as well, we need to satisfy a, a safe transmission of this data. We need to have a very uh, protected environment to satisfy this data. And we need to uh, create this environment. In the IRIS project, the other work package was working in how to create a safe environment into the cloud uh, to we can how satisfy that as well. So it's something other, I think to the IRIS project is working as well, and the idea is try to connect all these ideas at the end. So after put the constraints and all this information, why we wanted to do that enrichment? We have postcodes and some uh, characteristics of the people. So how we can enrich this information and why we want to enrich this information? So for example, I live in, imagined in this address, and I wanted to understand how the physical characteristics can define my behavior and can enrich the data uh, using the physical and social dem demographic characteristics. So we can do this using geospatial data. That basically we have a latitude and longitude or a, con a conception where is this person uh, locate or living. And using this information, we can have a very powerful ideas. This is an example of Philip Island, like how you can understand like an island and how is the population that is living in this island to make a more powerful decisions. Another example, and I, this was before in the presentation, the previous uh, presenter about the geospatial correlation is very important because uh, everything is related else, but well, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. For example, we have this behavior uh, that the closest things or the people to live close to me have a similar uh, behavior. And one example to Australian love is the pricing of the house. For example, if my neighbor increase her price, I'm lucky because my price increased as well. So this is, means it's a high special correlation because we are at a certain point connected and then my neighbor are affecting me in my decisions. So the idea of when we introduce the geospatial notion is I can introduce in my modeling how the neighbor can affect the ideas and the decision of others. Uh, this happens in a lot of uh, humans uh, behavior, for example, politics, happens in economics, happens in a lot of behavior, even, oops, even in COVID, that is, when you have this correlation, this is a very good paper, you can identify or play with four ideas that is called hotspots, donut, call spots, and diamonds. For example, this is a paper in COVID when we found the, the blue areas, it are cold spots. This means it's not COVID cases in that area. So as a policymaker, I can ignore just the cold spots because it's not COVID cases. I can go and jump to hot spots, like the red areas, because it's a lot of COVID cases in the, in the red areas. But some ideas which we can identify with geospatial uh, correlation is the diamond and the donut. What is a diamond? Diamond is a, a hot spot that is related where the neighbors is a cold areas. This means in that particular point uh, is a lot of cases of COVID. For example, uh, so this is a diamond where all the cold spots are, where it's like neighbors of a lot of cold spots. So this idea as well, uh, you can do this with pricing of house. For example, if all the prices are increasing in your neighbor and you find a property like is cheap, you should buy that house if it doesn't have a lot of problems because you identify something called diamond that is good and is opposite to the directions of all the uh, behavior. Another use to wire spatial data, we can use a geographical weighted regression. It's a kind of regression model when you uh, penalize 
with the geospatial data. So you calculate the distance uh, about your neighbors and in, uh, do a penalization of the variable using this instance. And this is very powerful to some cases in crime. So you can use the population, the income, and you can understand how the crime and some human uh, phenomena are explained by this behavior. This is this idea before is supervised learning that like you have uh, to train the models, but you can even do as well unsupervised learning, and this means you can use the geographical conditions of the people and try to create clusters or groups of these people just for the characteristics where these people live. So, for example, you can say, okay, I have all these people here, I have all postcodes, and I can create groups and try to find similarities about the people that is in this room using geospatial data. Uh, so based in that introduction of the motivation, we try to create this geosocial to simplify all this process and try to uh, empower Australians, uh, like Australian research to uh, use geosocial data and uh, create a, like good projects and avoid all this time-consuming process. So the idea is to people start to introduce this in her research and don't be aware about all the uh, methodologies that is behind. So uh, to jump some of the complications, um, the things to when we are trying to do this tool, uh, I want to introduce very fast uh, some ideas that are important because yeah, at the start it sounds very trivial, like ah uh, yeah, just merge data is just do simple way. But we have to be afraid of some uh, more methodological things. So I want to introduce this with uh, the concept of uh, geospatial data. So we have the system. So the geospatial data is a representation of the reality. We have this real world. We have uh, now I'm in this room, and this room means something. We want to create a model, a mathematical model that can abstract this system. And when I share my location in Google, you can find me at the same point of the time. Even we have some problems when I share to my neighbor, she would say, oh, you are so far to me, this GPS is not working. The reason of this is because we create a mathematical abstraction of the real world. And this is created using a geodetic system. And the idea is to, we wanted to represent something unique in a mathematical model. We can do this in a different approach. We have a lot of parameters, mathematics, we have GPS. The idea is to we create a representation of the Earth. We can create, it's called geoid, it's a 3D representation of the Earth. When we have all the latitudes and longitudes and mountains, uh, we have everything. But this is very hard to use. So we create an abstraction. We create a ellipsoid and we put some parameters where we can find this uh, for example, we put a radius, we say this information, and we simplify the geoid with the ellipsoid. But even we are ignoring some things, like the latitude, the longitude, how we can get this approach. We can improve with the GPS data. We can use the GPS, the, uh, the satellites are into, into the sky, and we can just calculate a measure of latitude and longitude and try to simplify this way. So. When we try to simplify that, we use all the data, for example, the postcodes and the information, in different kind of uh, type of data. In particular, is vector maps and raster maps. Vector maps is like play tangram. You have a different uh, like shapes, and with these geometrical uh, shapes, you can have operations. Or you have raster maps that is a picture, like Google Maps, and you have pixels. In particular, in geosocial, we focus on in a lot of uh, geospatial data focus in shapes. And these shapes can be three types, points, lines, and polygons. When we have a point, is for example, I'm here, latitude and longitude. Lines is the street, and polygons is uh, the suburb, or Australia. So when we have these polygons, we can have special operations. We can have special aggregations, special joints. I can ask for myself, where is the next uh, neighborhood? Or where is the next street? Or how long is this street? 
We have intersections, we can have union, difference, uh, centroid, and other operations. Tomorrow we are going to focus in this into on hands. Uh, but the idea is to we have as well uh, aggregations. We can use all the postcodes that people were leaving and we can aggregate to another level. For example, we can aggregate to a suburb or even higher, like a state or country. But it's a, something very important is to all these ellipsoids we see have a different parameters. Different countries, different uh, research can use a different parameters of this work. If I use another parameter, my, res my study will be totally different from the other one because it's a lot of bias in the space. If I change a number, the latitude and longitude could be very far from the other one. So one important thing is be afraid of the different categorizations and the European Petroleum Survey Group create one definition called EPSG. This means like a system, like a library, like where you can find different systems like different uh, countries are using. And as researchers, we need to be afraid which one is better for us. We can use Antarctica, like it's a lot. Like the most commonly is 84. That is a standard version of the word. A lot of people are agree with that. But for example, if I'm doing a social research in what area and that metric system is not good for me, I can use one better. So this is just to show some of the complications. But here, a level of Australia start to more complications. So before, we used to have the Australian standard geographical classification, was 84 to 2006. And in 2011, uh, the ABS decided to create a better system uh, called Australian Statistical Geographic, Geographic Standard, where they changed all the definitions to say, well, we have before Oops, I, I think it's a bias opposite the, the titles of the uh, table. So the statical areas is 2011, and the other ones is static, statical distribution. Sorry for the typo. I will fix it. But the idea is to, this was before, and now it's uh, now. So 2006, we used to have these definitions, and we say we have something called a census collection districts. And after 2011, we start to create something called mesh blocks. And we say, OK, as a social, uh, if I'm doing a research, and my research starts in 84, I want to follow people for 10 years, 20 years. But now the definition where these people live change. How I can change this? So this is one of the most difficult things like we face in this project. And because after that, the mesh blocks was created. And the mesh blocks is a unit like uh, little blocks where you live in, and you can have other different uh, areas. It's the small uh, area one, small area three, uh, two, three, four, uh, states and territories. Here are some examples like how it looks each one of these areas. And all this is something called like is maintained for the ABS. But we have as well other information that is not maintained for the ABS called non-MBS structures. That is the postcode that we were talking. So for example, the surveys or in general, the people know where is my postcode, um, 3000 or 2000. I don't know <laughs> what is me, my small area three or small area two. So we, need, we face another difficulty that is how we can translate for postcodes that is non-ABS structure and the main reason is because postcodes are created by Australian Post. And if you want to get access for Australian Post, they charge you for the disinformation. And it's not a clear correspondence between the statistical data from ABS. So the idea is how we can connect these non MBS structures versus ABS structures. So one, one thing to we found, and it's very important, is called concordance and correspondence. Like it allows us in two dimensions. The first time is from postcodes to 
small areas trees, states, or ABS structures in the same period of time. For example, we can use the postcode today, 2024, and try to map into the ABS 2021. But the concordance as well allows us to play in the time. For example, we have some postcodes. Australia is growing a lot. And the postcodes that we create 2011 is not good enough for the 2021. So sometimes we, the census, do some modifications to the current postcodes and the current shapes, and they alter the shape of the uh, the area. That is a difficult thing when you are doing a social research study because you start living in one area and after this area change. So we need to have a translation across the time to normalize this at the same uh, dimension. So we can do this with something called concordance and correspondence. And the idea, like the census <laughs> create, or the AVS, was why don't create something called population weighted grid correspondence. So basically, we, if we split, this is an example, 2011, Imagine in this place live 40 people. And in 2016, we decide to split these uh, two areas into two. So how I can measure this previous area to the new one, I can use this population weight right correspondence, and I approach using the population to live in this area. So for example, in the small area 2016A, uh, we have 24, 28 people and before was 40. So this means to 70% now is mapping to the new area. So before it was 100%, we, in this new area, we have just 70%. After the other, the other case, the case B, we have here a 12. So this area represents only a, the 30%. But this have a lot of problems because in, inside the regional areas, Australia is a big country. When we go to uh, some areas, this one is Alice Springs, these little points are mapping all the small area. So the correspondence sometimes could be not clear because you have a small concentration of the people living in a big area and have some bias there. Here this line looks when you play, for example, postcodes to a small area 2011. So we have a approximation, like how is the space approximated from others. And this happens, or this approximation of the concordance is better in the cities. So this system is very good and uh, very uh, accurate into the big cities. In all the yellow part or very remote areas of Australia, we have a lot of problems because the population is very sparse and we have a, some difficulties there. But the census create, or the ABS creates some indicators too. We try to introduce an off tool to communicate to the social science the quality of your data. And this is called quality indicator when we have different ratios. For example, if we have 0 0.9 of probability, we can say you can continue with your research because it's good enough to use this number and you can continue with the same data. Sometimes we have 0 0.75 when say you need to be afraid of doing this linkage because you can just do a misunderstanding. So this uh, quality indicator, and I'm introducing all of this, <laughs> sorry if it's quite boring, but is to try to introduce in our tool as a metric system so we can show when you all the merge and we do this code, you can have transparency about what is happening behind the tool. Otherwise, we can, yeah, you can put a complaint like why I'm saying this, you never told me this. So we, we want to create this tool using transparency uh, uh, to all the users. So after introduce all of this, we can have a lot of uh, data integrations. We can do geospatial integration, so I can aggregate the data to live and in different levels. I can use temporal integrations. Uh, this means in different period of times, I can merge different uh, like databases, but I can do as well a sp a spatial temporal. This means at the same time, geospatial and temporal time, I will try to merge everything. 
So this is some examples. Like for example, if I want a longitudinal survey, like I'm observing people 10 years, I want to use a linkage with the census for the last three census. I need to understand how these shapes are changing, how these postcodes are changing, and how I can adapt this data. We have more complicated cases, like for example, we need to try to play how we can normalize so the same area, and after that we can do the merge with the other database. When we are using spatial data, we have two shapes, one, two means uh, the other data, but we need to have in the same year to be a uh, to allow the merge. So this is one of the, we have another other considerations, and it's a consideration like when we are doing research, we need to be afraid of the causality and temporary. Like everything can happen in different periods of time. Like for example, we can, even if we are observing two phenomena at the same time, can be a little lag between this. So we need to be afraid as well how the lags uh, can be afraid. Other consideration is the dimension before, the spatial uh, dimensions. So for example, this is the different representation of America when you have different APSGs. So they alterate the shape of the country based on what is your needs. So ideally, when you are doing geospatial data, all need to be in the same system. Otherwise, you have a bias that is changing the idea. And the other consideration is the concordance that I mentioned already, but one that is important that I want to introduce is the semantics. Census as well have been changing. The definitions have, have been changing with the time. And some example is census of 2011 have some levels of income. 2016, we create more levels of income. How you can translate for one year to another year. Or even another example is the variable level of highest education, educational, like we have some certificates in 2011 and 2016. So when we are trying to observe it of following people for 10 years, and we, I, I want to see the variables of the census or sociodemographic characteristics, I need to try to as well normalize these variables. Otherwise, I cannot compare two different concepts. So the semantics was so important in this project as well. That is another work package that like focus on how to improve the semantics. And we received this information from there. Uh, but it's some limitations that we need to be afraid when we are using geospatial data. And it's like we sometimes wanted to get more into the detail. I want to see why this. And a lot of social research wanted to understand why these people or the house of this person have these characteristics, like go to the detail. But sometimes we cannot because we is spatial aggregation and we want to protect the privacy. So we need to use a highest version of, for example, small areas or states information and aggregate data. Uh, we have as well measure error. So some people can lie or have errors into the data that I tell us, so we need to be afraid of this. And we need to be afraid as well about the assumptions that we make about the people. So when I remember that you need to be very, uh, you can say these people have this behavior, this hypothesis. So we need to try to be like, uh, understand the context and why these assumptions. And so the limitation is this sometimes could be very expensive in a computing capacity. So after this introduction, I want to show now how we create a tool. So we start with these ideas. We understand all the things that we wanted to do. So we start to create the solution using a five-stage process. We emphasize with the people first, understand what is our custom, like or uh, clients in a certain way, define what is the user requirements, how we want to create this solution, have some prototypes first, like we idea, like we no, create idea first, and we create some prototypes and tests. And we do these loops a couple of times uh, to improve our solution. This is <laughs> uh, sounds 
uh, well, this is the geo social service design tool we create. And the idea is to we receive, receive inputs from different work packages, like the iris. For example, we can receive uh, information about vocabularies, that is Basel, the word package 2, and some curation data, that is word package 6. So in this part, we receive some inputs from other people. We receive some, peop some inputs from the long longitudinal uh, data surveys that we want to enrich, and we receive information from the census that we want to enrich as well. And we can add a uh, com complementary data. So the solution consists in creating a toolbox that is main called R library. And this R library contains a main script that allows you to run all the functions of the code and doing using a parameter file. So the parameter file are defined where is the longitudinal survey, how many years do you want to merge, uh, which variables are your interests, uh, and other kind of parameters that you are doing to the enrichment process. All of these will be created a linked data, so the output of this solution will be the data already enrichment for you can use and do regressions or whatever kind of analysis already. You will have a log report that explains how each process was created and a PDF report that allows you to understand how to run each chunk of the code like have a documentation and very well doc uh, trained material. The question is why do uh, our library? Well, the reason is to we cannot run this in a cloud environment or into my explorer because this means to I need to upload the data to a server and I can damage some of the policies with the data custodians. So all this part that is called work environment is responsibility of the user to maintain, and they need to allow all the protocols and standards of the data custodians. Yeah, this is sounds crazy because how you can communicate our library with the people like, ah, here's the library. So we create a user interface that can simplify the process and tailoring all the parameters to the users. So basically, the idea is to the user interface, interface create all the toolbox and all the parameters. You download it, and you just run the code in your computer, and you can have the outputs in R and in Stata to a lot of people use. Uh, <laughs> we create first the onboarding, like we define. This is the, the theoretical design, like how will be I'm going to show the demonstration process, like we do, how we did the process. But the idea is to we, we want to target two kind of users, middle user and advanced user. So the advanced user is the person that like play with R, they have a lot of knowledge, they maybe want to modify, modify some functions or even create her own functions. So he has or oh, she has a SD key a program like you can have uh, all the error libraries functions, like definitions, and you can create your own pipeline. For example, I want to create some modifications, and I want to customize all the libraries, so you have one different tailoring. And are the medium users like, I want to just do this data linkage easily, so I can just click, click, and continue, and co trust into the results that we are creating. So, this is a little concept about the, there was the idea, the, the initial idea about the, how is the interface. So interface, so we create a, the user enter to the website.